Hello everyone, I'm Chris Kyriakopoulos, part of the Organizing Committee of OpenConf. It's a great honor to present to you today Victor Farsi, who is a developer advocate at uh, Upbound, a sort of DevOps engineer with many years of, of working in the and uh, having uh, countless uh, books written. I don't know, Victor, you tell yourself. Okay, so what should I say? Yeah, uh, if I would need to uh, think about one word that describes me that's being lazy, <laughs> uh, there is a perfectly wow. good explanation. Basically, I was very early in my career, I started focusing on automation. And that was my way to, I was always trying mm -hmm. to automate everything I have to do so that I can spend time on the things I want to do. Uh, that's what led me to CICD, DevOps, and all those things, right? So, and I actually have a theory that lazy developers, you know, developers who do not want to do the things that they don't like, they're the good ones, right? Because they try to figure out how, how I can improve my workflow so that I don't do it anymore. Great. So, I mean, so having worked uh, with uh, so many of my platforms and languages over the years, I wonder, where do you find the inner fire to stay up to date with the latest trends and at the same time knowledge and expertise to the tech community through trainings? You have countless trainings on YouTube, uh, Udemy, uh, you've done toolkits for DevOps, you know, with different languages. Uh, where do you find the time, man? I mean, it's... I don't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work a lot, but uh, seriously, the, the, the drive really, uh, I don't know how it's now with younger generations, but at least when I was starting, uh, nobody, almost nobody became a developer because that's a profession, that's something you study, right? Uh, most of us, at least in my generation, became developers because that was our passion, right? Uh, in my time, there that's was so no even real decent school about that, right? So I am fortunate in a way that I'm getting, earning money, getting salary by doing things that I like, right? That I want. And to me, that's the major driver, right? I like my work. I like, uh, I'm like a kid in a toy store, right? Ima imagine having a five-year-old, putting him in a toy store and say, this is all for you, right? What would that kid do? Probably if we, if he would play with 15 minutes for one toy and then jump into another and then third one, right? I do the same thing. I I get bored by doing one thing and one thing only for a long period of time. So most of my career, I was just jumping. Oh, now this is interesting. Now, oh, okay. Oh, the, what is this thing, Java? Oh, is it a Python? Oh, go, wait. Oh, there is Kubernetes, right? So I like playing. I'm like a kid. And uh, that happens to be useful to some, right? And that gives certain level of experience yes. that, I mean, we, we need the people who are specialized in something. We definitely need, that's extremely important. But we also need those uh, horizontal experience people, right? Who understand the system as a whole. And that's where I come in and my desire to play with toys. Do you have a uh, language that, uh, you know, maybe even at the early stage of your career, you started playing with it and this is like your favorite toy, if you want to call it like like that, since you enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, depends. There are kind of two questions that I heard. What, what, what is the language I started with and what's my favorite language today? The, they're very different, right? I, I started, I had very unorthodox beginning of career. I learned how to program because I got a computer with a book in German, which I did not understand. And then I learned how to write the things in that book. I, to this day, I do not know even which language it was. <laughs> uh, later on, I had to figure out how to work in assembly. Nobody does that anymore because I was obsessed wow. cracking games and, you know, doing piracy and all that stuff. Uh, so I, I used Python a long time ago. I got, to be honest, I got disappointed. And, and I'm talking like 10 years ago or something like that. I got disappointed because Python community could not figure out, is it Python 2 or is it Python 3 and what works and what doesn't work? Uh, that was a big thing. I still like right. Python. Uh, but okay. uh, today I'm mostly, mostly focused on Go because most of the tooling and the projects I'm currently interested in are written in Go. So then I like the language as well.
now you're since you're working at you know a corporation you need to produce code uh, how about security and uh, you know you are a devops advocate you know you're somebody who pushes technology time to market uh, automation and the ci cd life cycle um and you like automation you mentioned it uh, you know since yeah. the beginning what about security though security comes in and says well hold on here i need to inspect everything you're doing how do you uh couple with that how do you manage it so uh i think actually automation is extremely important part of security itself right uh Mm -hmm. And and I'm not a security expert, so what I'm saying, my I have I have understanding, I have knowledge, I do work in security in some capacity or another, but that's not my main focus to begin with. But uh, the most insecure thing are humans. <laughs> kind of like there is nothing more insecure than people, right? So automation <laughs> yeah, allows point. us to have, uh, you know. Uh, it's uh, security is obviously an issue, and it's hard to get things secure, but. If we get to the point that we have repeatable processes, that we know what is happening every single time we do something, right? And that that something is always recorded and logged. We are still not secure, right? But it is so much easier to figure out what's going on and why something is happening and so on and so forth. If we sure. have repeatable processes, right? And if everything happening is recorded somewhere. And that's where automation kinks in, right? I'm a huge fan of uh, of GitOps, right? And I think that human work stops when we push something to Git. After that, okay. it's machines doing stuff, right? And it's so much more easier to secure things when you know that, hey, I know exactly what will happen, right? When I give somebody, a colleague of mine, access to the cluster, then I don't know what will happen, right? I, I, because I, anything can happen. Anything. Uh, so, yeah, having that bridge between systems and humans and that bridge mm -hmm. being Git, I, I think helps a lot because I know exactly what you wanted and you have no access to the system. On the other hand, I know exactly what will happen uh, because, you know, everything else after Git is fully automated, right? Uh, except observability, maybe. You, when you say time to market, uh, you want to press a button and send something to production. You need, uh, in between this uh, automation life cycle, you need to put some security controls, right? Well, even if yeah. they're automated, there's even, uh, you know, controls for automation uh, QA or uh, testing, you know. Uh, so yeah. I guess this also, you know, helps the security of the whole process to kick in. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Definitely. It's, but that's all part of the same story, right? I assume that most of security uh, solutions today and experts and so on and so forth, they're also writing code. They're also pushing it to Git. And you might be writing admission controllers for Kubernetes, right? That will prevent certain things from happening unless certain conditions are being met. You might be using that's OPA true. Gatekeeper. You might be using Kyverno. Um, you're probably, you know, a lot of change since like. 10 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, uh, most of security, the way I see it, is not really, I, th I think that from my perspective, security is based on two things uh, today. If we could design system from the scratch. First is that we are reacting to certain events, right? Whenever somebody, I don't care about how you push image to a container registry, but I know that I have a process that will scan that image and reject it if doesn't meet the clients, right? Uh, I don't care how you interact with your clusters, but I know that there are admission controllers that will prevent you from doing silly things and so on and so forth. Right? Let's talk, let's uh, get another topic into the discussion here. Um, what about remote work? Since, you, you know, you're into YouTube, uh, you know, uh, presenting uh, in a fashion, we, now we're talking about metaverse, things are changing, everybody can work from home, from virtual environments, interacting with people in different places. How do you think uh, that is going to progress after COVID, let's say, or in the future? So those things were already, I think that we were already moving towards uh, mainly remote work before COVID. What COVID did 
is speed up the process that would take longer, right? Not necessarily, it, it did not really, it's not because of COVID we are remote, but because of COVID, the process of moving towards remote work uh, sped up. I, for example, I haven't been in an office, uh, except when visiting somebody uh, for like uh, 10, 15 years, even though I'm not a freelancer, I work always for a company, yet uh, always fully remote companies. And I think it, th there are certain challenges uh, when you're fully remote, especially challenges when you're junior, right? When you're just finished uni, you need a lot of hand holding, right? You want to be surrounded physically by people who are experienced and just kind of absorb what they do. You can do that remote, but it's easier when we're face to face. On the other hand, the problem with office work is that the pool is very small, right? So let's say that I need, I'm going to, I'm looking for somebody to work where I work. I'm inventing a use case and I need certain level of a certain type of expertise, right? If I look for it only in Barcelona, I'm limited with my options, right? Once you're remote, then your options is a planet, right? I can find somebody in Greece. I can find somebody in Turkey. I can, it could be a US, it could be Germany. So companies, by going remote, uh, two things are happening. First, companies have much more choice of who they really need. And also, uh, workers have a choice who they want to work in with, right? This is especially problematic if you're in a smaller city, right? Smaller town, there are two software companies. So whom are you going to work with? I mean, one of those two, right? All of a sudden, the whole mar whole planet is a market. Uh, and, and that really changes drastically the game. And I, I have friends, for example, who, uh, who moved to Barcelona because uh, a while ago, because that's where job opportunities are within Spain, Barcelona and Madrid, right? Those are the basically yes. 80 or 90 percent of job opportunities in software industries in those two cities. Now with wow. remote work, a uh, few of them uh, chose to stay in Barcelona because they like the city, but some of them went back because they never came here because they want to be here, right? They came here because that's where you have to be because of work, but now it's remote. Now you can be wherever you want. Does, I mean, not everybody, right? So I'm not saying that 100% of the workforce is remote, but all of a sudden, hey, you like living in, uh, uh, I don't know, in Thailand, kind of like, why not? You like staying where you are, why not? A, a lot more opportunities. And also, I feel that we are, it takes time to get used to it, but I'm much more productive because I work only when I'm productive, right? Right now, I might have a, my brain might stop working, functioning. And if I would be in the office, I would still be in front of computer faking that I'm working. Uh, at home, I would go and watch Netflix for half an hour, right? And then you say, oh, okay, okay, now I'm kind of like, now I'm feeling it. And you go back and you do the work. You do the work when you're productive. And that's that's extremely important. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're saying that it's a trend that it's here to stay and uh, more companies you think are going to get into it more and more. And also actually gives you opportunities to find talent globally, you know, where you're exactly. searching for particular, you know, uh, technology specialist. So, yeah, I think there are exactly. many advantages. Uh, COVID, I just there is one problem. Mm -hmm. There is one huge problem. Uh, if I would rank the options, I would say, hey, fully remote companies, in my case, that's where I want to be. But if I would be offered to choose to go to the office or work remote where majority of people, while well, majority of people are in the office, I would go to the office. You being remote, minority of people in a company being remote while majority is in some office, that's the worst combination. Because then the culture is different. Then you're out of the loop. All the decisions made next to the coffee machine do not involve you. So fully remote is great. Fully office is okay. Uh, you remote while everybody else is in the office is, does not work for me. What you're saying, I, I understand. So anyway, so let's let's get back to you know the the new the new enter, entry uh, 
newcomers in the, the industry. You know, people that want to get into the technology, become developers. Yeah, obviously, you're a senior. You've, you've been, you've seen it all for many years, um, and you have, I think, you have a vision of where we're going from here. So, would you recommend? You know, what do you think are the trends of the future? And what would you recommend the the young, new, brave developers? What would you suggest that they follow? Uh, I, so, th th I actually have two different answers to that because. Uh, uh, what will where we are and where we are going is not necessarily what young developers should follow, uh, which might sound contradictory. But let's start with the first one, right? We are we are in the era that every everything is moving to cloud, uh, and everything is going to be service consumed by somebody. And uh, the whatever we are doing today will not be a job tomorrow because simply, you know, um, the needs of what we are doing is always going. You know, today I'm doing this. Tomorrow I'm replaced with uh, a script or artificial intelligence, and I need to kind of like be always on top of what uh, what is happening, right? Uh, whether that's uh, Kubernetes, containers, cloud, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, blockchain, all this stuff, right? And the problem is that by the time you figure it out, it will not be the thing anymore. It will be the boring thing that nobody wants to do, right? So kind of like you have a very short window to jump into something. And here comes the problem is if if you're studying right now, or you just finished university, there is that need. Oh, I want to jump into Kubernetes, right? Or I'm using Kubernetes as an example. It could be anything else. The problem is that I see many younger generations that completely miss on the baseline that makes all that things, all those things happen, and have a real trouble adopting. Like, hey, it's so easy in cloud, right? I do not need to know Linux. No, no you do, right? There, there are some basics that that are almost unchangeable, right? Uh, so, yes, I would recommend anybody to jump immediately in, to jump into cloud and containers and Kubernetes and artificial intelligence or whatever you choose to do but only after you master the basics, right? Very often people ask me, which language should I choose to, to learn programming? Any, it does not matter. You need to learn how programming works. Once you do, and here's a test. Uh, I'm going to give you a test to prove that you learn programming. I'm going to give you the program in a language you never saw. And if you can do it, then you know actually how that works, right? Because That's they're all important. based on the same logic. So the future trends we can't really predict, but do you think that there is something out there currently that uh, will kick in more in the future? Obviously, containers is becoming more and more every day we see, and cloud computing, microservices. Do you see that flourishing, or do you see something that maybe it's going to come in a technology that you have picked up, uh, you know, yeah, in your experience? So on. On a short run, I'm talking about, let's say, next year or next two, three years. The next big trend, trend is that Kubernetes is going to disappear completely. Uh, we are not going to yeah. see it. Wow. Uh, no, no. But pay attention. I'm saying you're not going to see it. Meaning that okay. it will be similar to what hypervisors are today. Like if you're using AWS, right? Or Google Cloud so, or Azure. You're not using. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing hypervisors. You have no idea that hypervisors yes, exist. Yes. Yet, yes. yet hypervisors are powering all that. You have Same the front end. end. You're using the front end of it. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you say I want a virtual machine, right? Yes. Yes. So that's where uh, that's where significant number of companies are right now, including mine. Right? We're all trying to figure out. Kubernetes was never designed to be used directly by anybody, even though people. Think that it is. It's a baseline, just like hypervisors. And now we are all trying to build layers that will make it completely disappear. So mm. I, I, I would predict that a couple of years from now, or even shorter, even sooner, you will be using Kubernetes without ever seeing the word Kubernetes, right? Without ever interacting with it directly. Uh, so that's that's the next wave, making it disappear, right? At least within the area that time. Uh, specifically interested right now. Okay. 
Uh, during the event, we're going to talk a, a, a bit about metaverse, the new technologies. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wonder, do you see yourself getting involved in that uh, area of uh, technology? Yeah, uh, probably at some moment, yeah. Uh, I will, I almost never get involved in, uh, in a technology from the perspective of building something for the end users. Uh, most of the time I spend time, I'm focused on building uh, or helping build uh, tools that help other people build end user tools, right? Uh, that might sound confusing, right? But I'm kind of like, I'm very focused most of my career in uh, tooling that helps developers rather than, you know, the users of those developers. So yeah, uh, some form of... Uh, I don't like calling it virtual reality. Let's let's not say metaverse because we don't know whether it will be that one um, is going to kick in. I'm not so optimistic. I don't think that we're going to see it in the next couple of years. Um, but once we do, it will be a big change, right? <laughs> to begin with, they need to they need to remove those things around my head. Okay. for that to be yeah, useful that's right going to be interesting how it's going to work uh, actually everybody is looking forward or wondering what's gonna what's gonna be like but uh okay uh we, we took a lot of time we took a lot of your time we appreciate it um uh would you like to tell us uh, since we have uh, you know uh, your speech at uh, we're fortunate to have you on our conference uh, uh on uh, open conf 2022 and uh We'd like to, you know, hear a few things, a few teaser points about uh, what you're going to discuss on your speech. Yeah, so uh, my speech will be about shifting left with uh, an example of uh, backend database, backend application with a database. But that's just an uh, example. Now, to clarify, maybe not everybody is familiar with the term shifting left. That means that. Um, the things that are typically done on the right side of the process later, you know, what operators right. and sysadmins and security people do, trying to move those things towards towards left, towards developers and enable developers to do something, uh, to do things themselves instead of opening Jira tickets, right? Um, and usually we call those that area today internal developer platforms or platform teams or something like that, and that encompasses really everything. Uh, so that will be the subject of my talk and the demo will be, hey, how can you as a developer use effectively Kubernetes and deploy your stateful applications and manage your databases without really uh, spending seven years trying to figure out all those things, right? Uh, so very much about one group of people enabling other group of people to be self-sufficient. That sounds exciting and very interesting. We're really looking forward uh, to to hear your speech uh, and uh, looking forward to the event, of course. So um, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And uh, thank you for inviting you know, me. We appreciate your time also, and we'll be all together at the uh, OpenConf December second and third. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> We're really excited uh, that you're going to be with us there. So looking forward I'm to... I'm excited to be there. You know, physically, not just in a, you know, a remote working fashion. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.